While he was born in Indiana, Foley grew up on Long Island. Mick Foley's father was a high school athletic director, so it was basically required that Foley play sports. He played several, but perhaps unsurprisingly, amateur wrestling is what Foley got the most interested in. In addition to participating, Mick also liked watching wrestling. Jimmy Superfly Snuka really stood out to Foley, so much so that when Snuka took on Don Morocco in a steel cage match at Madison Square Garden, Foley made sure to get as close as he could to the action. That night, Foley knew he wanted to become a wrestler. Superfly's iconic splash from the top of the cage was so inspiring to the future hardcore legend that he wanted to spend his life trying to give other people that same feeling. Through a few connections, Mick Foley met a man named Dominic Danucci. Danucci trained the young Mick Foley and began molding him into the WWE legend we all know. Speaking of WWE, in 1986, the company contacted Dominic Danucci asking if he had some students who could wrestle. Danucci pointed to Mick Foley, who had only wrestled one match at that time, and Mick got to step inside a WWE ring for the first time. In his WWE debut, the hardcore icon was smaller and went by the name Jack Foley. The man not called Mick teamed up with a guy named Les Thornton. Their opponents were Davy Boy Smith and Dynamite Kid, the British Bulldogs. Thornton started the match for Foley's team against Smith. About a minute later, Mick Foley tagged in at the same time that Dynamite Kid became the legal man. Mrs. Foley's baby boy got destroyed by the kid and then got beaten by the boy. The hardcore legend mounted a comeback, but actually hurt himself when he went for an elbow. Dynamite Kid then got back into the match and nailed Mick Foley with a clothesline. That clothesline was real, by the way, and the injury prevented Mick from eating solid food for a few weeks. In general, the match was legitimately brutal, since the Bulldogs wanted to make sure everything looked good, especially since Mick Foley was so inexperienced at this point. Ironic that this happened in Foley's first WWE match, considering all the stuff he'd later do to his own body. Anyways, the match finished when Dynamite Kid hit a back body drop suplex from the top rope and got the pinfall victory. While not much of a match, this showed that Foley could take a beating, both in character and in real life. This wasn't Foley's last beating either. The future hardcore legend would wrestle a few more WWE matches, all of which he lost. By early 1987, Mick Foley stopped wrestling for WWE and was competing for smaller companies. It was here though that Mick would really define his character. He started calling himself Cactus Jack and began wrestling in more extreme and dangerous matches. Foley re-entered the mainstream spotlight in 1991 when he joined WCW, still wrestling as Cactus Jack. He had some memorable matches and moments, particularly with Sting and Vader. However, disagreements with WCW management led to Foley packing his bags in 1994. The hardcore legend soon found a new home that fit him quite well in ECW. The Extreme Company really helped cement Mick Foley as one of those hardcore wrestlers of all time. The man would do just about anything to entertain the fans, regardless of his own well-being. Being. After being absent from WWE for about 10 years, it was finally time for Mick to return. Jim Ross, who Foley had met in WCW, was now working for WWE and was the one who helped bring him back to the company. However, he wasn't coming back as Jack Foley. WWE had the idea of Foley playing a masked character, which Mick wasn't into at first, but eventually came around to once he gave some input. Foley created a persona named Mankind, a deranged and creepy individual. In addition to a distinct look, Mankind would also stand out for having both an entrance and exit theme. Look at this. What's gonna happen when Mankind hits the ring? Come over here. Good thing we didn't see him at Russell. Get up there, McMahon, go ahead. WWE fans got their first look at Mankind on the April 1st, 1996 episode of Raw, the night after WrestleMania 12. He defeated Bob Hawley, but didn't stop there. Later in the show, Mankind attacked The Undertaker and started a feud with the Phenom. The masked monster kept interfering in the dead man's matches and showed they had mystical powers rivaling The Undertaker's. This led to Mankind's first pay-per-view match at King of the Ring 1996, where he and Taker fought for over 18 minutes. In an upset victory, Mankind defeated The Undertaker after Paul Bearer accidentally hit the Phenom with his urn. Even after this victory, Mankind continued to target The Undertaker and the two waged war on each other. They brawled in the ring, amongst the fans, backstage, and just about everywhere else. This made way for The Undertaker and Mankind's second match against each other at SummerSlam. This time, the two fought in the first ever Boiler Room Brawl. It was another physical and violent fight that saw Paul Bearer get involved again. This time, Bearer intentionally attacked the dead man, giving Mankind another win and aligning Paul Bearer with Foley. 
While Mankind continued to feud with Undertaker, the masked maniac got a shot at the WWE Champion, Shawn Michaels. The match ended in disqualification when Michaels' other rival, Vader, interfered. The Undertaker also got in on the action, setting the stage for Taker and Mankind's third encounter at In Your House 11. The two made history again by competing in the first ever Buried Alive match. While Mankind would technically lose, Paul Bearer and another masked wrestler, The Executioner, interfered and buried The Undertaker alive instead. Finally, after months of feuding, Mankind and The Undertaker had their fourth match against each other at Survivor Series. It was just a normal match, except that Paul Bearer was suspended above the ring in a shark cage. This proved to be the X Factor, as The Undertaker finally got a decisive win over Mankind. To make matters worse for McKind, he also lost a No Holds Barred match the next night on Raw. That wrapped up his rivalry with The Undertaker for now, and the next few months were kind of uneventful for Mankind. After a really strong debut, Mankind began losing the majority of his matches, particularly the ones against bigger names. Mankind did get another shot at the WWE Championship in March 1987, but lost. Ironically, Mankind would form a short-lived tag team with the man that cost him his first WWE Championship match, Vader. The two even challenged for the World Tag Team titles at WrestleMania 13, but were unsuccessful. Shortly after that, Paul Bearer, who was still managing Mankind, had a change of heart and begged The Undertaker, who is now WWE Champion, to take him back. Paul Bearer made a big mistake though. He didn't give Undertaker the Manscaped Performance Package 4.0. Why is this the perfect gift for any man? Well first, 80-90% to 90 of women prefer a man who does some grooming down there. Trust me, I know that trimming your goods sounds intimidating, but that's where Manscaped comes in. They are the leaders in below the waist grooming. Manscaped's Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents. Plus, it's got an LED spotlight so you know exactly where you're cutting. I'll admit, I was a bit nervous at first, but the Lawnmower 4.0 was easy to use and I got a perfect trim right away. But that's not all you get in the Performance Package 4.0. You'll also receive the Weed Whacker. This is what you use to get those annoying, unflattering hairs in your nose and ears. The Weed Whacker provides proprietary skin safe technology, which helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs. It doesn't stop there though. You'll also get the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and Crop Reviver Toner to keep you smelling good. Plus, the Performance Package 4.0 comes with performance boxer briefs and a travel bag. If you need some help staying groomed or you're looking for that perfect gift for your hairy friend, then the Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 is right for you. Go to manscaped.com and use code TAPOUTCORNER for free shipping and 20% off. That's right, 20% off and free shipping when you go to manscaped.com and use code TAPOUTCORNER. Be thankful and give the gift of Manscaped. I guarantee your balls will thank you. I'm thankful to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to Mankind. Paul Bearer didn't give The Undertaker the Performance Package 4.0, so the dead man refused the offer. Mankind, though, used the opportunity to get a sneak attack on his rival. This reignited their feud, and Mankind and Undertaker faced off at In Your House 14, with Taker's WWE title on the line. Despite having Paul Bearer in his corner, Mankind was not able to get the job done and lost. To make matters worse, The Undertaker shot Paul Bearer with a fireball and left Mankind without a manager. But where Mankind was going, he didn't need a manager. Following the defeat, Mankind would begin to take part in a series of interviews where he would reveal his past, which was based on Mick Foley's real life. Up till this point, Mankind had been a villain, and while he still was, fans began to cheer him after learning about the man under the mask. As this happened, Shawn Michaels and Stone Cold Steve Austin became the tag team champions. However, HBK got injured and couldn't wrestle, leaving Austin to defend both titles himself. Mankind volunteered to help Stone Cold, but the Texas Rattlesnake wanted nothing to do with the masked man. Then, during a tag team title defense against Owen Hart and, funny enough, the British Bulldog, fully debuted a new persona called Dude Love, based on a character he created back when he was a teenager. Stone Cold was stunned, but did accept the dude's help. Over 10 years after their first encounter, Mick fully defeated British Bulldog and became a tag team champion at the same time. After the feel-good moment, however, the 
tag team title reign of Stone Cold and Dude Love abruptly ended when Steve Austin would tragically get injured at SummerSlam about a month later. At the same time, Mick Foley was in a feud with Triple H that started when the game beat Foley in the final round of the King of the Ring tournament in June 1997. They had a rematch at SummerSlam inside a steel cage with Mick Foley as Mankind. During the match, Foley recreated the moment that inspired his whole career by getting on the top of the cage and giving Triple H an elbow drop. Foley's rivalry with the Camp Canes did stop there though. The next time they fought, Mankind wrestled as Dude Love. Unfortunately, Love did not prevail, and Mrs. Foley's baby boy ate a loss. However, this paved the way for one of Foley's most iconic moments. On Raw, Foley was scheduled for a Falls Count Anywhere match with Triple H. A backstage video played of Dude Love and Mankind talking about who should fight Triple H. They decided on Cactus Jack, Foley's old character that had never appeared in WWE. It turned out to be the right choice, as Jack and Triple H had a chaotic and violent match that ended when Cactus piledrived Triple H through a table and won the fight. That ended the feud and kind of put a pause on Foley's career. He would still wrestle and had small rivalries like with Kane who had just debuted at this time. However, nothing significant happened for the rest of the year. Foley would keep going between his three personas. However, Foley would sit on Cactus Jack for a little while when Terry Funk debuted in WWE as Chainsaw Charlie. Funk and Foley had a history together outside of WWE, so this pairing worked well. The Cactus and the Chainsaw got involved in a feud with the WWE Tag Team Champions, the New Age Outlaws, when Road Dogg and Billy Gunn put both men inside a dumpster and chucked them off the stage. This led to a dumpster rules match at WrestleMania 14. Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie won, making Mick Foley a two-time Tag Team Champion. However, this tell reign was even shorter than the first. The night after WrestleMania, Vince McMahon stripped Cactus and chainsawed the titles since they didn't put the outlaws in the correct dumpster. The two sides had a rematch that same night in a steel cage match to crown new champions. Thanks to interference from Foley's old rival Triple H and his group DX, Cactus and Chainsaw lost the match. In the aftermath, Foley would come out as himself and turn heel, telling the fans he hated them because they didn't appreciate him and only seemed to care about Stone Cold. This was kind of based on how Foley actually felt. In real life, Foley was upset that his hard work couldn't compete with Steve Austin's popularity. Mick didn't just want to be another wrestler on the roster, but no matter how much punishment he put his body through, it didn't seem to make a difference. Anyways, Vince McMahon told Stone Cold that he'd face a mystery opponent at the next pay-per-view, Unforgiven. That mystery opponent turned out to be Dude Love. The match ended in a DQ victory for Love, but of course, he didn't win the championship. McMahon told Foley that if he wanted another shot at the WWE title, he had to beat Terry Funk. The two extreme wrestlers fought in the first official hardcore match in WWE history. This is also the first time Mick Foley wrestled under his real name. Mick won, earning himself a second championship match at the Over the Edge pay-per-view. Foley competed as Dude Love again, but this time the match was no disqualification and Vince McMahon was the special guest referee. Despite all this and having McMahon's stooges helping out, the dude could not win, but that was mostly because of The Undertaker's interference. The next night, McMahon fired Dude Love, and that was the last time fans would see the character until 2012. With the love gone, Foley reverted back to Mankind. He also started wearing his iconic white shirt and necktie. Despite the changing character, Foley still had a bone to pick with The Undertaker. This set the stage for Foley's greatest moment of all time, his Hell in a Cell match with Taker at King of the Ring 1998. This match is arguably one of the most violent ones in WWE history, and the one moment that everyone remembers is... The match was absolutely brutal, and this is the moment that would lead to Foley becoming a megastar. After concluding his rivalry with The Undertaker, Foley moved back into the tag team division with Kane. The two had won a number one contenders match earlier, which gave them a title match against the New Age Outlaws. The masked teammates won, and in about a month and a half, they became two-time tag team champions. Their partnership and championship reign ended at SummerSlam 1998, when Kane abandoned Mankind, leading to Foley's defeat. 
After this, Mankind would start to play more of a comedic, goofy character, a far cry from how he debuted two years earlier. He created a sock puppet named Mr. Socko that became part of his Mandible Claw finisher. Mankind also started to make friends with Vince McMahon. At first, this irritated the boss, but McMahon soon realized he could manipulate Mankind. Vince created a new championship for Mankind, the hardcore title. Mankind held the championship for 28 days until losing it to Big Boss Man in a ladder match. Despite being the inaugural hardcore champion, Foley would never win the title again. However, that didn't really matter because Foley was headed to bigger and better things. The WWE Championship had been vacated, setting up a tournament in the 1998 Survivor Series to crown a new champion. With help from McMahon, Mankind was a favorite to win the title. Foley made it to the main event, where The Rock was the only thing staying between him and the WWE title. During the match, Rock put Mankind in a sharpshooter. Despite not submitting, Vince McMahon had the ref call for the bell. Of course, this is a reference to the Montreal Screwjob one year earlier. This this officially made Mankind a good guy again, who is now out to destroy McMahon and The Rock. Mankind got his hands on the WWE Champion again at the final pay-per-view of 1998, Rock Bottom, in your house. The referee awarded Mankind the victory after The Rock was unresponsive. However, McMahon overruled the title change because Mankind promised to make The Rock submit, which Mankind technically did not do. Foley managed to get one more shot at the WWE Championship on the first Raw of 1999. The match was no DQ as well, leading to quite a bit of chaos. This included Stone Cold giving The Rock a chair shot to the head, allowing Mankind to win and finally beat The Rock. This was a huge accomplishment, and arguably the best moment in Mick Foley's career. This led to one of Foley's best matches, his I Quit match with The Rock at the 1989 Royal Rumble. The match was another classic, brutal Mick Foley match, but many agree it went too far, with a lot of unprotected chair shots to the head. Regardless, the match ended when Mankind said, I quit. However, it was later found that this was a recording of Mankind saying, I quit, from weeks before. This rivalry wasn't over yet, though. Mankind and The Rock fought in their famous empty arena match shortly after the Royal Rumble. Unlike their I quit match, this one was all fun, and even better for Mankind, he won and beat The Rock to become a two-time WWE Champion. A fifth match between the two was set for St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Playing off their I quit match, this one was a last man standing match. It's not remembered as well as their other fights, possibly because neither man could stand before the count of 10. This caused Vince McMahon to schedule a ladder match between Mankind and The Rock the next night. The recently debuted Big Show interfered during the match and cost Mankind the WWE title. That ended Foley's feud with The Rock, and he turned his attention to The Big Show. The two faced off at WrestleMania 15, where Mankind won when The Big Show got himself disqualified. They had a rematch in the next pay-per-view, Backlash, this time in a Boiler Room Brawl match which hadn't been seen in nearly three years. Mankind won again, but in a twist, he and Big Show would team up. Along with Ken Shamrock and Tess, they formed a faction called The Union. They teamed up to take on the Corporate Ministry, a large group of wrestlers that were running roughshod in WWE. The Union defeated the corporation at Over the Edge 1999, but a week later, disaster would strike. On Raw, Mankind renewed his rivalry with Triple H. The two fought in a hardcore match that Triple H won thanks to a little help from China. After the match though, Triple H attacked Mankind with a sledgehammer, which put Mankind out of action for about three months. This was because Foley needed knee surgery for some injuries he had suffered in his previous matches. Mankind returned in August 1999 when he interfered in Triple H's match against China and helped the ninth wonder of the world win. This ultimately led to Mankind facing Triple H and the WWE Champion Stone Cold at SummerSlam for the title. With Jesse Ventura as the referee, Mankind edged out the win and became WWE Champion again. Well, for all of a day, that is. The next night on Raw, Mankind fought Triple H for the belt. Shane McMahon was the referee, and he helped the game beat Foley and take the WWE title. While that was disappointing, something big was just around the corner. The next week, The Rock was attacked by The Undertaker and Big Show, who were the tag team champions. The Great One challenged both men to a two-on-one match later that night. Mankind knew it was suicide to face Taker and Big Show alone, so he offered to team up with Rocky, which the Brahma Bull reluctantly agreed 
agreed to. Despite all odds, Mankind and The Rock defeated their opponents and became the new tag team champions. They called their team the Rock and Sock Connection, but things were off to a rocky start. A little over a week after winning the tag team championship, The Rock and Mankind lost the belts back to the Big Show and Undertaker when they were defeated in the first ever tag team buried alive match. However, shortly after, The Rock and Sock Connection got their titles back when they defeated Big Show, Midian, and Viscera in a Dark Side Rules match. However, however, three days later, Mankind and Rock lost the belts again, this time to the New Age Outlaws. Even without the Tag Team Championship though, The Rock and Mankind still made history. On September 27, 1999, Mankind hosted the This Is Your Life segment for The Rock. This one moment brought in the most viewers ever for Raw, and the record still is yet to be broken. Despite that, two weeks later, The Rock said he was tired of Mankind and didn't want to be partners anymore. Mankind begged The Rock to team up with him for one more match. The Great One agreed, but Mankind didn't say who their opponents would be. It turned out to be the New Age Outlaws. To The Rock's dismay, they won, which meant they were champions champions again and would be teaming together for a little while longer. I do mean little. The next week on Raw, Mankind gave The Rock a copy of his new book. However, Mankind later found it in the trash before he and The Rock were supposed to defend their tag team championship. An upset Mankind refused to participate in the title defense, leading to The Rock and Sock Connection losing their titles again. Later on, it was discovered that Al Snow was the one who actually threw the book away since it contained a lot of jokes about him. Anyways, while The Rock and Sock Connection would team together a few more times, they mostly went their separate ways. While all the stuff with The Rock was going on, Mankind was still feuding with Triple H, as well as the McMahon-Helmsley faction. This included a Boiler Room Brawl match between the two that the game won, as well as a rematch for the WWE Championship that Mankind won via disqualification. Towards the end of 1999, Triple H had gained control of WWE. This led to him putting The Rock and Mankind in a pink slip on a pole match. Basically, whoever lost would be fired from WWE. The Rock won, meaning that this was it for Mankind. Luckily though, The Rock and the other WWE wrestlers threatened to walk out of the company unless Mick Foley was reinstated. Triple H begrudgingly agreed and Mick was brought back. This time, Foley returned as Cactus Jack again and he fought Triple H once more for the WWE title. The match happened at the 2000 Royal Rumble and it was a street fight. Like the previous year, this is another extreme and violent match that Foley did not win. Like all good feuds, Triple H vs Cactus Jack didn't stop there. At the next pay-per-view, No Way Out, the game and the hardcore legend fought in a Hell in a Cell match. The match had a special stipulation that if Jack didn't win the title, he'd be forced to retire. Like Foley's Hell in a Cell match with The Undertaker, he took a massive bump by falling through the top of the cell. But also like his Hell in a Cell match with Undertaker, Foley was defeated. However, in true wrestling fashion, this wasn't McFoley's last match. A few weeks after No Way Out, Linda McMahon, using her authority, set up and added McFoley to a WWE Championship match at WrestleMania 2000. At the grandest stage of them all, Foley took on Big Show, The Rock, and the champion, Triple H, in a fatal four-way elimination match. While Foley wasn't the first wrestler eliminated, he was the second, when the game gave Mick a pedigree onto a steel chair to pin him. This kind of marked the end of Foley's full-time in-ring WWE career. Mick Foley would later become the WWE Commissioner that same year. He notably always had his office in an unusual spot and would go for a cheap crowd reaction by shouting out the name of the city that WWE was in. By the end of 2000, Foley was fired from the Commissioner position, although he would continue to make a few sporadic appearances for about a year, often as a special guest referee. Foley returned in 2003 when he was honored for his achievements and presented with the Hardcore Championship. Later that same night, Foley was attacked by Ric Flair and Randy Orton and was punt kicked down a flight of stairs. Mick would make a comeback in December and a match between the Hardcore Legend and Orton was set up. However, Foley was too scared and backed out, leading to Randy Orton calling Mick a coward and spitting in his face. A few weeks later, the co-general manager of Raw, Stone Cold, was upset that Mick Foley backed out and gave the hardcore icon a spot in the Royal Rumble and expected him to be there. Foley did show up, being the 21st entrant, and eliminated himself and Randy Orton. With the rivalry reignited, Mick teamed up with his former tag team partner, The Rock, and The Rock and Sock Connection reunited to take on Batista, Ric Flair, and Randy Orton at WrestleMania 20. Unfortunately, the numbers advantage got the better of Rocky and Mick, allowing Evolution to pick up the win. This feud with Randy Orton ended at Backlash, where Foley fought the Legend Killer in one of the best hardcore matches of all time. 
The most memorable moment was when Foley threw Orton into a pile of thumbtacks. Despite that, Foley lost yet again. The next time fans saw McFoley in the ring was about a year later. At the Taboo Tuesday pay-per-view, Foley wrestled Carlito in a one-off match. Fans got to vote on which character Foley would wrestle as, and Mankind was chosen. Mankind went on to win the match, and this is the last time McFoley wrestled as the deranged mass character. Several months later, McFoley refereed a WWE Championship match against Edge and John Cena. When Cena won, Edge became irate and attacked Foley. This led to Mick challenging Edge to a hardcore match at WrestleMania 22. Edge accepted, leading to another unforgettable moment in McFoley's career when Edge speared the hardcore icon through a flaming table. Foley lost the match, but he was impressed by Edge and ended up aligning himself with the Radar Superstar. The former rivals teamed up on Lita to take on Terry Funk, Tommy Dreamer, and Beulah McGillicuddy in a hardcore tag team match at One Night Stand a couple of months after WrestleMania. Foley's team won, which led to Mick Foley's next rivalry. In real life, Foley had been critical of Ric Flair's creative decisions when the Nature Boy was in charge. Flair later said in his book that Foley was a glorified stuntman. The two had reconciled backstage, but turned the real-life drama into a storyline. The wrestling legends challenged each other to a 2 out of 3 falls match, which Flair won. A rematch was set for SummerSlam, this time it being an I Quit match. Like many of Mick Foley's big matches, this one was insanely brutal. Ric Flair, though, lived up to his nickname, the dirtiest player in the game, when he threatened to hurt Melina, who had formed a friendship with Mick Foley, unless Foley said, I quit. Mick Foley gave in and lost the match. Even sadder was that Melina would betray Foley shortly after SummerSlam. Mick wouldn't be back in WWE until 2007. He was one of five men in a WWE Championship match at Vengeance that year, but ended up not only losing, but being the guy that got pinned. He also got involved in the Vince McMahon illegitimate son storyline that even saw Foley and Hornswoggle team up and work together for a short while. In 2008, after competing in the Royal Rumble match, Foley moved into a commentator role on SmackDown. Mick described the role as creatively frustrating, so he let his contract expire and left WWE. In storyline, Foley was attacked by Edge, which explained his departure. After WWE, Mick Foley spent roughly the next three years in TNA, aka Impact Wrestling. This is the last time Foley would wrestle full time. While most wouldn't say Foley's time in TNA was bad, there wasn't much noteworthy other than comparing his empty arena match with The Rock to the attendance at a TNA show. Anyways, in November 2011, Mick Foley returned to WWE. He hosted a This Is Your Life segment for John Cena, of course inspired by the segment he did with The Rock 12 years earlier. Speaking of which, the moment was interrupted by The Rock who gave his former tag team partner a rock bottom and then left. Despite the rough return, Foley continued to make a few more appearances. In January 2012, Foley announced he'd participate in the Royal Rumble match. This set the time and place for Foley's final WWE match. About 8 minutes into the 2012 Rumble, entry number 7 came out, which was Mick Foley. The hardcore legend joined Primo, Justin Gabriel, Cody Rhodes, and The Miz. Foley first went after Primo and sent one half of the tag team champions flying out of the ring and eliminated him. Cody Rhodes tried to get the jump on Mick, but Foley turned things around. It looked like Mick Foley was going to team up with Justin Gabriel, but had a change of mind. The next participant, Ricardo Rodriguez, entered the match, which caught the attention of Gabriel and Foley. Mick ended up forming an alliance with Rodriguez, and the two eliminated Justin Gabriel from the match. Right after that, Santino Morella entered the Royal Rumble. Ricardo wanted a piece of the Cobra, but Santino won the fight and eliminated the re-announcer. Santino and Mick Foley then locked eyes and pulled out the Cobra and Mr. Stocko respectively. Before either one could strike, Epico came running out. The Sock and the Snake decided to team up and they managed to eliminate the other half of the tag team champions. The Cobra and Mr. Stocko then returned to their fight, but the battle was interrupted by Cody Rhodes and The Miz. The A-lister went after Foley, but Mick fought back and gave Miz a taste of Mr. Sacco. This, however, opened Foley up to an attack by Cody, which then allowed Rhodes to eliminate the hardcore legend. In total, Foley spent 6 minutes and 34 seconds in the Rumble, making him the 12th longest lasting participant in the 30-man match. He also eliminated three people. Only Big Show and Cody Rhodes eliminated more, so pretty impressive on Mick Foley's end. When I first thought about it, I thought that one of Mick Foley's matches with Randy Orton or Edge or even Ric Flair should have been his last. After thinking about it more, however, I don't really see his 2012 Royal Rumble match as a bad way to go out. Sure, a hardcore, brutal match would have been awesome and a very fitting end for Mick Foley, but that's not all Mick was about. The first thing most people think of when it comes to Mick Foley is his crazy and painful stunts, 
but another big part of Foley's career was his comedy and goofiness. The last few matches of his WWE career didn't really highlight that part of him, so seeing it on display at the Royal Rumble was not a bad way to end things. Plus, seeing Mr. Sacco and the Kroger Square Off was low-key pretty cool. After the Royal Rumble, Foley continued to make one-off appearances. He would even get physical sometimes, but nothing nearly as extreme as he did earlier in his career. Foley would return on a more full-time basis in 2016 when he was named the general manager of Raw. It lasted until March 2017, and ever since then, Foley has gone back to doing one-off appearances. We talked about him a lot in this video, so the question must be asked. What were The Undertaker's first and last matches? Find out by watching the video on screen.